Hello, everybody. This uh, short talk is one of the series of Coffee Conversation Lectures given every Wednesday morning uh, in the Dublin City Gallery, the Hugh Lane. In normal times held at the gallery itself, the talks are given by members of the gallery's panel of artists and lecturers, such as myself, and followed by a cup of tea or coffee and a chat among the attendees about the work discussed in the talk and, of course, about life in general. My name is Tony Suttle, and I'm a member of that panel. Today, I will be talking about the life and work of the Irish artist Cecil King, an exhibition of whose work is currently showing at the gallery as the COVID uh, restrictions are being reduced. The main body of Cecil King's work as a painter during his lifetime can be described as hard edge, modernist in style. It's quite abstract in appearance, with perhaps only the titles giving an element of connection with what might be described as the real world. So as we discuss Cecil King and his work, I will talk briefly about his connection with this gallery, the Ulane, and also with my personal interest in his work. First, the Dublin City Gallery, the Hulane. Cecil King was actively involved in all six of the Rosk exhibitions held between 1967 and 1988. The contemporary element of the third Rosk, Rosk 77, was held in the Hulane, and so Cecil King and the then curator of the gallery, Ethan Waldron, were in close contact and cooperation for that event. Four years later, the gallery hosted King's first major retrospective, and now we again present a major exhibition of his work to note the centenary of his uh, birth in 1921. This coffee conversation is part of a number of activities organized by the gallery in the context of that exhibition. So as I welcome you to this talk, sorry about that, um, as I welcome you to this talk, I also suggest that you browse the gallery's website. It currently contains a number of items uh, relating to Cecil King and his work, much of which I have drawn on for this short introduction to him as a person and as an artist. What I plan to do is to give an overall view of Cecil King, his life and work, with reference to the 21 of his works in the gallery's collection. And I will also describe briefly my own personal relationship with his work and its role in my life as an art lover and as an art historian. Now I'm going to come off screen so we can focus on the uh, slide images. I will start with this image of six of the 21 of King's works in the gallery. These are six screen prints, the Berlin Suite, made in 1970, roughly a midpoint in King's relatively short life as an artist. In addition to his painting, King was a frequent printmaker, perhaps because of his earlier career in the industry, which would also have informed his love and use of color, both in, both in terms of paint and of printing inks. And as you can see, these works are all abstract and titled with reference to a specific place, in this case, Berlin. James Johnson Sweeney, former director of the Guggenheim Museum in New York, and a close collaborator with the architect Michael Scott and Cecil King and many others, in the organization of the initial Rusk exhibitions, described Cecil King's work as an artist as follows. Intensity, is the key to the quality of Cecil King's work. Sweeney identified elegance, meticulousness, and conviction, combined with sensibility and modesty as the essence of King's art. For almost all of his working career, King worked in a manner which can be described as hard edge abstraction, though as a label or categorization, hard edge may be somewhat misleading as regards his work. Unlike other hard edge abstract painters, I gather that King did not use masking tape or similar techniques and painted by eye. I'm well aware that his abstract approach to art making with little or no apparent reference to our own visual awareness of the physical world around us can generate difficulty and even anger for some viewers. So before we begin to discuss Cecil King himself and his work, I would like to begin by looking briefly at what is broadly described as abstract art, 
and why perhaps it warrants our attention and hopefully our respect for what it attempts to achieve in ways not necessarily achievable by more representational or recognizable works. Although abstraction is often associated today with what is described as modern art, in fact, it goes back much further. Using one of my frequent sources, Murray's Dictionary of Art and Artists, they quote the Greek philosopher Plato as follows. Okay? I do not now intend by beauty of shapes what most people would expect, such as that of living creatures, but straight lines and curves and the surfaces are solid forms produced out of these by lathes and rulers and squares. These things are not beautiful relatively, like other things, but always and naturally and absolutely. Which perhaps reminds us of Cezanne and his advice to look in nature for the cone, the sphere and the cylinder. Okay. This is the curbstone at the entrance to the burial chamber at Newgrange, made in about 3000 BC, earlier than the pyramids. We can see stone chiseled, stone chiseled markings on stone. We can see spirals, a mix of circularity and diamond shapes. Why was it done? What do they mean? Was it perhaps an, all about ownership and presence or is it primarily functional? What we can see is that it was important. It was something that took time to make when all energies might be needed to fight off strangers and starvation. And it does not attempt to be representation. We can see it is abstract and ask, is it art? Although made in the late 1900s within our lifetimes, these two works are in a sense older in their origins than Newgrange. They are both by indigenous Australian artists, both draw on a visual culture which is possibly over 50 millennia old. Originally, such painting would have been done on a transitory basis as body painting or patterns made in the ground. Now typically made with oil or more usually acrylic paint, their sources go back a very long time. As with Newgrange, these traditional mark makings may have served a variety of purposes. They may have had an educational role in the context of rituals, of dance, song and image, passing on from generation to generation messages of where food and water might be found in the hospitable environment of the Australian outback, or of marking territorial control, or of commemorating significant events of both past millennia and of the more recent past. The upper painting made in 1995 by Emily Kamek Kwangwe is called Big Yam Dreaming. And it relates to a major food source of her tribal family or linguistic grouping. Despite her success and the large prices her work subsequently achieved, she remained on an Aboriginal or indigenous settlement in the Utopia area about 250 kilometers from Alice Springs, largely supporting the rest of her extended family. The lower work is by another slightly younger male indigenous Australian painter, Rover Thomas. The work is made with natural earth pigments on canvas. It refers to an historical event in the late 19th or early 20th century where a number of Aboriginal or indigenous original settlers were murdered by incoming white men. These works combine the spirituality of the Australian dreaming traditions and both of the artists affinity with both the land and their observation of it and of their awareness of historical events in a given area to be noted, recorded and painted and then remembered by their familial, tribal, or linguistic group successors. Both Emily Kamekwangere's and Thomas's work is widely collected, and both represented Australia in Venice Biennales. I suggest that in both cases, this type of Australian art represents to Western viewers a form and the appeal of contemporary modernist abstraction. However, to the artists who made these works, drawing on a totally different cultural history, I believe their perception of such works is likely to be substantially different to that 
of those of us who are viewing it through our Western post Renaissance eyes. Here we are back at one of the starting points of Western visual culture, Greece, at just under a millennium BC, with two examples of early ceramic ware from the collection of the Metropolitan Museum in New York. Again, in both cases, using largely geometric or abstract patterning. The ceramic jug to the left is decorated with purely geometric patterning and the newer work about two to 300 years later as a mix of geometric patterning and simplified depictions of human activity, not dissimilar to earlier images found in Egypt. These type of image led to later more sophisticated drawing and sculpture and eventually their impact on the Romans and in due course, the Renaissance in Western Europe. This is an image of the Ardabil carpet, which is quite large, it's about 10 meters by five, from the Victoria and Albert Museum in London. Made in Iran in the 16th century, it is a good example of the Islamic tradition of image making and its disinclination to use a representational approach, particularly of human or animal subject matter. As a result, Islamic art has developed a tradition of pattern making with ingenious use of geometric and floral, often stylized motifs and of calligraphy used in both architectural and decorative applications, but again, abstract. So having considered briefly what might constitute abstract art, let us look at Cecil King himself. Cecil King was born in 1921 in Rathdrum, County Wicklow. For most of his early and middle life, King worked in business eventually becoming a director of the then Dundalk-based printing and bookbinding company, WNS McGowan. As a painter, he was largely self-taught, initially painting for pleasure, combining it with his business and other personal interests, and taking some tuition with two established artists, Neville Johnson and Barbara Warren. However, the most significant influence on King's approach to painting was the American painter, Barnett Newman, whose work we will look at in a moment. King became a full-time artist in 1964, and while leaving his career in the print industry, he continued for the rest of his life to be heavily involved in the promotion and development of contemporary art in Ireland, notably in the Contemporary Irish Art Society, and even more so in the organization of five of the six Rosk exhibitions held between 1967 and 1984. He died in 1986, before the last Rusk exhibition in 1988. This is a photograph of Cecil King with the then curator of the Hugh Lane, Ethna Waldron on the left, and the Ms. Mimi Benka, taken at a reception in connection with Rusk 77 from the Irish National Photo Archive, uh, part of the National Library of Ireland. These are works by each of the two artists with whom Cecil King took lessons at the start of his artistic career. Both were full-time artists, earning livings in the mid 20th century, a difficult time to be doing so in Ireland. Both did a certain amount of teaching and included Cecil King for a time amongst their students. Neville Johnson and King had perhaps one thing in common in that Johnson had also started his working life and business but had then turned to being a full-time artist. Both Neville Johnson and Barbara Warren had tried a variety of approaches to art in their earlier careers, including surrealism and cubism. But both were reasonably well established and somewhat more settled in their styles at the time of their involvement with Cecil King, who was somewhat more of a late starter. I feel that the two works here are reasonably typical of Johnson and Warren's later styles. Both, I suggest, rather dry, slightly stylized landscapes. On the upper left, Neville Johnson's Landscape Rock Pool, a northern canvas in the 1950s, is in the Hugh Lane collection. The lower work by Barbara Warren, Summer Estuary, or as Beg, also oil and canvas, is on the website of Adams, the auctioneers. However, the artist who had the most significant impact on Cecil King was the American Barnett Newman. Newman was born in New York to a family of Jewish immigrants from Poland. As with King himself, 
Newman started his working life in the business world in his father's clothing company. He then earned his living as a teacher, writer and critic and began to paint in his 20s, initially in an expressionist style, all of which works he later destroyed. He then painted in a somewhat surrealist style for a while before in his 30s, developing the approach which marked the rest of his career. Newman is seen as a pioneer of color field and hard edge painting. As we can see from this early work titled One Month One, it consists of areas of color separated by thin vertical lines or zips as Newman called them. The zips define the spatial structure of the painting while simultaneously dividing and uniting the composition. Commenting on his own work, Newman wrote, what is the explanation of the seemingly insane drive of man to be painter and poet, if it is not an act of defiance against man's fall and an assertion that he returned to the Garden of Eden? For the artists are the first men. My struggle against bourgeois society has involved the total rejection of it. The image we produce is the self-evident one of revelation that can be understood by anyone who will look at it without the nostalgic glasses of history. Throughout his career, again in a way somewhat similar to Cecil King, Newman was always very active in writing and in the organization of art-related events, in the promotion and explanation of his own work and that of other contemporary modernist artists. These are more examples of Newman's work. The upper one is a photograph of Newman himself in front of one month V1 or one month six, a variation of his earlier work and a lower image is part of a set of Stations of the Cross now in the National Gallery in Washington. Cecil King met Barnett Newman when Newman and his wife Anna Lee visited Dublin when three of Newman's paintings were included in Rosk 67, in the organization of which King was very much involved. And I will read a description now of one of Newman's works in that exhibition, Queen of the Night Two, written by the Irish writer John Banville, who before turning to writing had initially thought to become a painter. Banville wrote, it was a blue vertical canvas, sky blue, with one white line down the side, and it was the best picture there. And I kept coming back to it saying, but there's nothing there, there's nothing here. Yet the whole point of it was that all of Barnett Newman's life as an artist had gone into taking away from that picture. So the weight you felt was the weight of absence, the weight of all of the stuff he had thrown away. And that's what artistic work is. It's not self-expression, it's not putting things in, it's a way of expressing something in the most economical way. So let us come back to Cecil King himself as a businessman and as an artist and a person with a significant interest in collecting and promoting contemporary art. In 1954, in his early 30s, he began to paint, somewhat influenced by his early tutors, Neville Johnson and Barbara Warren, and in the, light, in the late uh, 1950s, he did a series of cityscapes of Rings End and the docks of Dublin, painted in muted tones with an emphasis on form and shape rather than detail or anecdote. This work, November, from this gallery's collection, with its dramatic interplay of broad stretches of paint boldly applied in subtle tones of blues, greys and blacks, is a good example of this period in King's development. And in the second half of the 1960s, he produced a body of work in pastel based on themes of stress and tension from the world of the circus, with a particular reference to the trapeze with its combination of elegance, balance and danger, and a sense of tension, both in the equipment itself and in the audience waiting for a fall. Then, as we have seen in 1967, he met Barnett Newman, the acknowledged pioneer of color field and hard edge painting. Newman's philosophy based on the supremacy of the canvas itself over all illusion 
our expression became an important element in King's future work. In the Berlin series of paintings and prints that he worked on in the early 1970s, the canvas was divided into mathematically precise areas of color, separated by thin, often white lines that added a spatial dimension to the composition, despite the extremely restricting rules of hard edge painting. King managed in these and subsequent pictures consistently to present impeccable modern canvases of brilliant color and clarity that are individual and recognizably his own. Tension and force were states which King had frequently explored in his earlier work and which continued to interest him into the 1980s. Let us look again for a few minutes at these six images from the Hugh Lane's total collection of 22 of Cecil King's works. These are six of his Berlin series of prints, all made in 1970, in fact, a set of six. I would like to speak for a few minutes on my own perception of two aspects of King's work. One of these is a comment on his titling of his work. The second is what I would refer to as the content or subject matter of his work. Let me start with titling. The titling of any work can be, can be a treacherous area. In some instances, such as the French 19th century early Barbizon painter, Millet, whose well-known painting, The Angelus, went through several name changes to help make it more sellable in the United States. Titles can be arbitrarily changed by galleries or dealers or by owners at certain stages of a work's life. Equally, artists themselves may consciously use titling and wordplay to either help or hinder the viewer. The conceptual artist Marcel Duchamp was particularly prone to do this. In the case of Cecil King, I believe that his titles are those which he himself allocated to his works. And while the works themselves are abstract, the titles are more directional. In many cases, they refer to either specific geographic locations or types of location. Amongst the titles of the 21 works in the Hulane collection, he has used the titles or words entrance, threshold and intrusion on several works. These to me suggest his interest, as with many artists over the centuries, with the liminal or the point of entry to a location or space in a directional, in a directly representational work. King's works may be purely abstract, but I suggest he is giving us a certain indicator as to where we are or where perhaps he feels the space in the work itself is. More directly, he has titled two of his series of prints as the Berlin series and the Saarbrücken series and others as Baggett Street and Harlem's. Now let's look at the matter of what might be described as the subject matter or motifs of King's work. If you feel an abstract work can have what can be described as a subject. The Berlin prints, of which, as I've said, this gallery has a complete set of six, were made after he had visited that city, which at that time was divided by the Berlin Wall. And with that, the tensions of the two very different regimes on either side of the dividing wall. So shall we look for a moment at the matter of how does one make a visual image which will give a sense of tension within a geographic or topographical space? Let's take our own cities of Dublin and Belfast as possible examples. As with any city, or in fact, probably any place containing mankind, but Belfast and Dublin each has a set of tensions, some unique to each city. In Dublin, standing at one end of either Connell Street or Gardner Street, an artist can choose to capture the street realistically, using the geometry of perspective to narrow the street itself towards vanishing points, and doing so for the roadway, the buildings on either side, and for the human figures along the street. With that geometry, the artist can capture a selection of narratives, such as we find in Walter Osborne's or Jack Yates's street scenes. Or, looking at the same view, an artist can sense the invisible tensions of the place, the tension of crossing either street at rush hour. Traffic accidents statistic would suggest this as an activity is probably more high risk than a circus trapeze act. 
an artist can choose to depict the tensions of visible poverty on the street, or the tensions of history in the bullet holes on the GPO and on the O'Connell statue. Although I'm less familiar with Belfast, as I stand there on one of its streets, although everything looks much like any other European city, I'm aware of the nightly news bulletins, of the relatively recent disturbances, of the still active oxymorons, the peace walls elsewhere in the city. I'm aware that possibly half of those on the pavement beside me don't fully trust the other half on the same pavement. I'm aware of the tensions of their lives, of their evaluating each other's backgrounds and possible political views from the color of their hair, from their school uniforms, their accents, and if it comes up, from their names and the many other signifiers of identity. In short, how can an artist depict tension, either social or personal? How does an artist depict balance or rupture or separateness? Again, either personal or social, physical or emotional. These are all, I suggest, the topics or subject matter of Cecil King's art. Let me quote a comment from Ethna Waldron, the then curator of this gallery at the time of Ross 77 and her cooperation with Cecil King. The color variations introduced the city's subtle changes of mood and emphasis, while the basic tensions remained taut and keyed up to fever pitch. So I suggest that what King captures in much of his work is that sense of tension in our lives. And in the geometry of his work, in his palette of colors, he captures our tensions with courage, with elegance, and with great skill. Now, let's look at some of King's work in the gallery collection, other than the prints on which I have been focusing so far. These are two works made by King the year before he died. On the left, Pendulum, and on the right, Link 3. Both are oil on canvas. Again, I will quote from a gallery director, this time from the present director of the Hugh Lane, Barbara Dawson, in an extract from her notes on the current exhibition. Looking back at Cecil King's work, it is unique in 20th century Irish art practice, eschewing figuration, the pastoral and the poetic. His work fearlessly defends the independence and beauty of color and line. Varying from the slight to the robust, these lines swing against and cut through intense depths of color, creating geometric forms teetering on the edge of implosion. But pitch perfect, the taut and rigorous compositions deny any suggestion of impending chaos or collapse. Now I will talk a little about this image and my own relationship with Cecil King's work. This image, red abstract, does not, does not hang in this gallery, but on my bedroom wall. It has been an important element in my own journey, to use that contemporary and somewhat abused term, journey. I have been looking at art since I was a teenager and found my comfort zone in the sort of work being made by many Irish and other Western artists in the mid 1960s and 70s, a sort of post-impressionist midway between representation and abstraction. But pure, full-on abstraction eluded me. I didn't get it and couldn't generally read it or relate to it. However, the organization for which I worked for the last 20 odd years of my formal working career had a smallish corporate art collection comprising mostly of prints acquired, I think, by a subscription to a print gallery which had offered a set of four or five new prints every year. This particular work, Red Abstract, a screen print, had hung in the chief executive's office, but now a new incoming chief executive changed all the works in his office and didn't fancy this one. So I asked the office manager, could I have it in my own office space? I had decided that by living with it every working day, I might end up seeing what it was all about. And it worked. After three or four years, I'm a slow learner. I began gradually to like the work, I could sense its energy and the rightness with which it had been made. Then, when I decided to take early retirement, I asked the office manager, would he have it valued and I would buy it? He said, no, the paperwork was too much trouble, so I had to leave it behind. However, and that is the beauty of printmaking, 
another copy from the 100 copy edition came up at White's Auctioneers and I was able to get it at more or less what I would have reckoned on paying to the office manager. So although I never met Cecil King, I will always be grateful to him for helping me to learn to accept and enjoy the Barnett Newmans, the Jackson Pollocks, the Joseph Albers, and of course, the Sean Scullys of the art universe. So now I will end again on a somewhat personal note, not with a graphic work, but with a sculptural piece. Cecil King lived for the final years of his life on Idron Terrace in Black Rock, across the railway line and looking across the bay towards the bay towards Hoth. Some years ago in the Dunleary Rattan, uh, some years ago, the Dunleary Rattan County Council commissioned this work by Irish sculptor Colin Brennan in memory of Cecil King. Now, I've lived most of my own life in the Black Rock area, so I drive past this work frequently and find it a delightful homage to an artist whose work I admire and enjoy. So I hope this talk will help you to decide to visit the Cecil King exhibition here at the gallery and to fill in any gaps in your own experiencing of Cecil King and his work that I have not had time to fit into the last half hour. And also perhaps to encourage you, if you wish, to scan through some of the various items of information about him on the Hugh Lane website. So thank you for joining me. Uh, hopefully, uh, also being persuaded, if you are not already, uh, to come in and enjoy also some of the other more abstract works by other artists in the gallery's collection. Um, and so, for the moment, goodbye. <laughs>